Tumitilaot na ang manok Hudyat na ng pagpasok Paglilingkod na walang kapalit Sa bayan ng aming hati Tara na, kaibigan Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa'y susulong Ating abutin ang pangarap ni Juan Sa pamamagitan ng agham Ang kaunlaran ay makakamtan Kung lahat magtutulungan Tara na, sama-sama Itaguyod ang siyensya Maayos na bukas para sa Pilipinas Hamon ay haharapin Mahirap man ay kakayanin Sa pinagsamang lakas at galing Tagumpay ay mararating Tara na kaibigan Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa ay susulo Ating abutin ang pangarap iwan Sa pamamagitan na Tingabutin ang pangarap iwan Sa pamamagitan na Pangarap ko pong magkaroon ng effective communication means for emergency. Pangarap kong ma-maximize yung renewable energy source and to reduce the carbon dioxide emission. Pangarap ko pong maging scientist. Ngayon na o simula na, humanda sabay-sabay akyat, hawak kamay tayo'y ang ating lipad. Magandang araw at magandang alikampo sa ating lahat. 
Welcome to the sixth installment of our Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines or VIP program webinar series. I am Jovin R. Barcelo from the Environment and Biotechnology Division of the OSTITDI and I will be your host for today. So this webinar is part of the Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines or the VIP's information and education campaign on virology and other related topics. So this learning le uh, session is made possible by the collaborative efforts of the OST Central Office, the OST ITDI, the OST PCHRD, the OST Picard, and the DOST Balik Scientist Program. So I'm sure that everyone here is excited to learn. So a uh, quick reminder lang din po for our Zoom participants, kindly rename your Zoom account uh, to the format affiliation underscore your full name. So as an example for my name, DOSTITDI underscore Joven Barcelo. So don't also forget to mute your microphones to avoid interruptions during the presentation proper. So now, for today's webinar, we shall be learning a lot about the biosafety and biosecurity on human viruses, which will be discussed by our resource speaker, Dr. Teodoro M. Fajardo Jr., a balik scientist from the National Health Services of England, Royal London Hospital in the United Kingdom. But first, let's check the number of participants here in our Zoom meeting room, as well as our audiences from Facebook and YouTube live streams. So dito po sa ating Zoom, we have currently uh, 162 participants. And then for our Facebook live stream, we have 41 viewers. And for our YouTube live stream, we have 13 currently watching. Okay. So as a recap of our uh, last week's webinar, so uh, last week we had Dr. Christina Laura M. Layson, our Balik Scientist from the United States. So Dr. Layson discussed the bioethics on the use of animals in research, specifically the proper handling, sampling, and transport of avian species. So Dr. Layson shared topics regarding the guidelines on the use of animals in research, the three years of animal research ethics, that is yung reduction, replacement, and refinement, as well as some of the sampling methods and techniques in handling avian species without incurring stress or injury to our subjects. So last week po, parang puro manok or mga puro mga pato or puro po mga ibon naman yung naging topic ng ating two-day webinar last week with Dr. Layson. Uh, before we formally start today's uh, webinar, I think uh, we must uh, share first a couple of video presentations or AVPs para naman po magkaroon ng konting introduction yung participants natin to the VIP program as well as the Balik Scientist program. So roll the clip po. Thank you. We are now living in a new normal. This COVID-19 pandemic marks as one of the global challenges experienced in this generation. It forces every sector of our society to innovate in order to move forward. We at the Industrial Technology Development Institute of the Department of Science and Technology is trying every possible ways to continue our service to our people without compromising the safety of each and everyone.
So, Recognizing the critical role of science and technology in economic development and progress, the Balik Scientist Act or Republic Act 11035 was signed into law last June 2018 by President Rodrigo Roa Duterte. This is actually uh, putting into law a program that uh, has been started by the Department of Science and Technology almost uh, 40 years ago. Uh, but uh, we need uh, some uh, legal support so that we can implement it in a uh, better way. Yeah. The Balik scientists will have an uh, easier time in terms of uh, coming here to the Philippines and rendering services. Who is the Balik scientist? experience and expertise of uh, uh, Filipinos uh, who have made good uh, practice of uh, being scientists abroad so that we can uh, they can share whatever they have uh, in terms of knowledge uh, and wisdom to uh, our own institutions, uh, our own uh, researchers. My role and responsibility of a public scientist is to be not just a teacher or a facilitator, but also a pusher innovations within the program. Balik scientists are given support by the government for their stay in the country and are likewise provided with a wide array of benefits to ensure their maximum output. The best incentives or privileges or benefits are having to be exposed with our farmers. My greatest privilege would be uh, doing collaborative work with uh, fellow Filipinos. The DOST, as the leading agency in charge of the Balik Scientist Program, is tasked to facilitate the placement of the Balik Scientist among its priority areas from its sub-agencies. P-Card PCHRD P-Shared Partnering with the DOST are the host institutions, private or public entities, providing the appropriate resources to the Balik Scientist in the completion of their research activities and other tasks. I think the role of the institution is to give the space or the laboratory needed for the program or the project. Working together, the DOST, the Balik Scientists, and the host institutions have proven the importance of collaboration and cooperation, critical of any nation's vision for success. I am an advocate of Balik Scientist Program. Okay, being one, I really truly felt that uh, Balik Scientists would be able to help in uplifting the economic growth of, of, of the country. My hope is to really contribute to uh, the space agency. It's a very, very pragmatic and uh, we will need everybody's help and also promulgate the STEM program here in the Philippines. We really need to encourage other Balik scientists or other scientists abroad to uh, give their time. They need to give back and uh, help the country. With the enactment of the Balik Scientist Act, the country is looking towards a stronger and more solid science and technology foundation propelling the nation to further heights change has come indeed for science and technology science for change science for the people
So, yun po yung ating uh, maikling introduction on uh, the VIP program and the Balik Scientist program. So, now to formally welcome our distinguished speaker and of course our esteemed participants today, may I please call on Dr. Annabel Bribiones, Director of the Industrial Technology Development Institute for ITDI. Dr. Briones, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Joven. Our distinguished speaker, Balik Scientist, Dr. Chodoro M. Fajardo Jr., my ITDI family, DOST officials, colleagues, participants, guests, my warmest greetings to all of you. I want to welcome all of you here today and thank each of you for participating in this activity. Today is the sixth uh, webinar series of the project on uh, the DOST establishment of the Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines, or VIP as we commonly called it. So this webinar series will run through next year and we are fortunate to have seven Balik scientists who will share their expertise in virology. So the DOST VIP program was conceptualized to address the pandemic uh, readiness of the country. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic presents many concerns, particularly effective clinical and public health management, primarily on novel viruses. So these issues can only be addressed using science and technology, specifically through research and development. Thus, the OST finds a solution to this global concern by establishing a virology and vaccine uh, research institute with the primary goal of developing diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics. And in addition, the virology and vaccine institute will be the venue for scientists, both here and abroad, to work collaboratively to study viruses. So to institutionalize the VIP, we get support from our lawmakers, both in Congress and Senate, by passing the bill regarding the establishment of the VIP. So while we're still waiting for the VIP bill to be enacted into law, the DOST has initiated several R&D projects implemented by ITDI, or the Industrial Technology Development Institute, St. Luke's Medical Center, and Research Institute for Tropical Medicine, or RITM. So these R&D projects are being implemented in partnerships with several local and international researchers and institutions. So with these initial projects, we hope to build the capacity of the VIP and help resolve several of the pressing issues in the country brought about by viruses. So part of the uh, project's activities is engaging the expertise of the public scientists to help us accomplish these initiatives. Dr. Chodoro M. Fajardo Jr. will discuss the biosafety and biosecurity on human viruses. With that, I thank uh, Dr. Fajardo for accepting the BSP engagement and helping ITDI in the VIP program. My special thanks to the VIP team of ITDI, the Technological Services Division, and the Planning and Management Information System Division of ITDI for organizing this event, the Balik Scientist Program Secretariat of the Philippine Council for Health Research and Development, and PICAR, our ever-supportive Secretary Fortunato T. De La Peña, under Secretary Rowena Cristina Guevara, Director Jaime Montoya, and Director Rinaldo Ebora. I encourage everyone to join in the question and answer portion actively. So I hope you will learn a lot from this webinar. Again, welcome and a pleasant afternoon to all of you. Thank you. Thank you po, Dr. Briones, for your warm welcoming remarks for our esteemed guest speaker and, of course, our participants. So now to formally introduce our distinguished Balik scientist and resource speaker for this afternoon, 
So, Dr. Teodora M. Fajardo Jr. obtained his bachelor's degree in medical technology at Martinez College, Manila, Philippines, and work at the National Reference Laboratory for HIV, hepatitis, and other STIs of the Department of Health. He obtained his master's and doctorate degrees in molecular biology and molecular virology from the Universidad Autonoma de Madrid, Spain, where he finished as summa cum laude. As part of his doctoral thesis, he worked towards understanding the translation mechanism of P. coronaviruses, FMD and hepatitis C virus, and how they overtake the translation machinery of the cell. He was also a postdoctoral fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the United Kingdom, where he focused on the molecular biology of double-stranded RNA viruses like orbivirus and rotavirus, one of which is on how these viruses accomplish the complex genome sorting and packaging in viral replication. Besides, he also has a master's degree in public management from the Development Academy of the Philippines, Manila, and a doctorate in public administration from Polytechnic University of the Philippines, Manila. He was also employed at the University of Cambridge, UK, as a postdoctoral research associate, where he dealt with the molecular biology of Zika and dengue virus as a prototype to uncover the translational mechanisms of positive sense RNA virus or the flavivirus, mRNA regulation and replication. He left UK and EQAS or the National External Quality Assessment Service last year as SEO Healthcare Scientist Team Manager where he helped oversee the technical aspects of bacteriology and virology schemes, supervise the laboratory activities of scientific teams to ensure quality and GLP throughout the laboratory process, and generated and analyzed results of returned EQA results. He is currently the team lead of the molecular virology and blood-borne viruses at the National Health Services England, Royal London Hospital, United Kingdom. He is also involved in the COVID-19 response of the virus research department and the uh, reference virus unit of Public Health England, uh, specifically in COVID-19 RT-PCR in DRD and part of the trained personnel pool, as well as a regulated task manager in the Epidemiology Center of Public Health England. As an expert in molecular virology and molecular biology, he has published research papers international peer-reviewed journals, and served as a resource speaker in several conferences in different countries, including the United Kingdom, Spain, and India. Let's give a warm welcome and a big virtual round of applause to Dr. Teodoro M. Fajardo, Jr. Dr. Fajardo, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much for the intro. And also, salamat kay Annabelle and the uh, DOST official for organizing the business and also for is for hitting the VIP creation. Okay, so um, I will we'll have a one hour of a lecture. So I will distribute this as 40 minutes will be on biosafety, um, maybe 10 minutes on risk assessment, and 10 or five minutes on biosecurity. I might extend on biosafety because this is more important. Okay. I'm gonna turn off my video. You don't have to see me every time. I'm sharing my screen, can you see? Yes, sir, we can see. Okay, okay, good. Okay. All right, so um, in the beginning of the um, introduction, there were, I, I saw many people participating from different agencies. So the St. Luke Medical Center, there's DOST, FNRI, CLSU, and um, 
uh, UP Baguio, UP Delima, UP LB. So I chose some people because I want this lecture to be as uh, interactive as we can. And so, maging uh, mas exciting. Okay, so maybe mag meron akong, I mentioned the name and meron akong question, some questions for them. So don't worry, it's not an exam. Your you will still receive your certificate even if, if you you cannot answer, but I'm sure you will. You can you can answer. Okay, so I have this um, an outline. So uh, you, so you will have a guide. We'll start with the background on the biosafety and biosecurity and also risk assessment. Of course, I will discuss what is biosafety and biosecurity, the, including the, this, the introduction to that. And then I will um, define what, what are the biohazard risk groups and routes of infection. Of course, uh, basic are the principles of biosafety. The person doing the, the test or assay or procedures, the policy involved in that, if we have a standard policy uh, that includes the SOP or the statutes or law, and then the PPE, personal uh, protective equipment, the containment method, the facility design, and many others. Of course, what are the biosafety laboratories and the levels? There are four levels. And then the method of disinfection, because this is the, the fundamental. You cannot do biosafety if you don't know the principle of disinfection, sterilization, and how to clean up your spills, okay? And then the last, with, last two would be the risk assessment for biosafety, how to do that. In every procedure, you have to do a risk assessment and then biosecurity. Okay, let's have some background. So biosafety started in the Philippines in 1990 when uh, the president uh, Aquino um, signed a um, executive order. So this is just to create the National Secu um, Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines. So this is called NCBP. And then this is the first biosafety system in the developing world, so imagine that. And then on the same year, biosafety guidelines released by the NCP and, and CBP, a multi-agency committee from DN, uh, the Secular Collaborative Agency from DA, DNR, DOH, and the OST. So in uh, 2006, the Executive Order 514 was uh, created, establishing the new agencies, the National Biosafety uh, Framework prescribing the guidelines for its implementation, of course, strengthening the National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines and for other purposes. So the NBF, is, this is the combination of policy, legal, administrative, and technical instrument. Okay, so nandito yun, ito yun nag for now. Oh, sorry. Right, so I don't know, I, I don't have any idea if the, the NBF or NCBP can create or implement a law on the biosafety or we, if we have that in the Philippines. So these are the concerns. These are the concerns on establishing the VIP. Um, is something blocking my screen. Okay, do we have a biosafety law or regulation on viruses, plant, animal, or human viruses, and particular, of course, particularly human viruses? Do we have a biosafety law regulation on virus handling? So can we handle virus uh, on under risk group one to four? Or the manipulation of it, if you want to do genetic manipulation or, or uh, recombination. Uh, to handle wild type virus collection, for example, if you want to collect a virus from um, wild animals or wild birds, do we have a law about that? Like how many or how wild the virus can be collected? Okay, and store it, of course, to genetically manipulate it or recombine it. And then do we have a biosafety law regulation on handling and manipulating pathogenic and highly infectious human viruses, particularly in BSL-3, uh, processing in BSL-3 or BSL-4, or risk the virus under risk group three or four. So for creation of the BIP, we will need this, to need a concrete and clear policy on biosafety and biosecurity, we need to establish advisory committee on dangerous pathogens, substances, or information. So information are also subject to biosecurity. They are very, very confidential information. That when it leaks, it will damage, do a lot of damage. Okay. So we need an advisory committee for this. So they will formulate and then create like risk group one to four of organisms. What can we handle? What viruses can we handle? What are the limits? Okay. And then need to establish guidelines on risk group of organisms, as I've already mentioned. 
and need to manage by safety and by security in, in terms of inspection of BSL laboratories. Who is doing the inspection of biosafety laboratories in the Philippines, particularly a P3? And of course the P4, there's no P4, but I don't know if we have a P3, but the CL2, like I know that the Department of Health is um, inspecting uh, laboratories for, for um, hospitals and clinical laboratories, but who is inspecting laboratories for research? Okay, especially those handling a, um, a novel viruses or wild type viruses, okay? And then we need uh, BIP to set standard and guidelines on what can and can't be handled. And who becomes the repos repository of dangerous pathogens? When we collect this, where are we going to store it? And who is going to be the caretaker of this? The substances includes and also the information that we create. And also, of course, the activities that can be carried out in CL3 and CR4. Who's going to control this? Okay, now we go to the biosecurity and biosafety, the definitions. Of course, biosafety is a discipline that addresses the safe handling and containment of infectious microorganisms. Okay. It also, it's also the creation, development, and implementation of administrative work practices, personal training, facility design, and safety equipment to prevent the transmission of pathogenic viruses to workers, the general population, animals, or the environment. And then biosecurity are measures and controls in place to prevent misuse or protect the release. It, the release could be deliberate or accidental of high consequence pathogens, toxins, pests, diseases, or animals as a result of misuse, deliberate or not. And the theft, accident, or carelessness. This is due to that. Okay. So in simple terms, because this definition is very long, I don't know if you can remember that in one minute. In a simple term, uh, can I ask somebody to to define biosafety in their simple term, like, uh, can I ask Christine Eden? It's a very simple term. Biosafety, what is biosafety work in the lab? Yes. Just a simple term. Christine? For biosafety, bio possibly. Very simple word. And the young definition of biosafety. You are working in the lab? Oh, maybe Naputol. Okay. Tawag na tayo na iba. Si, si Alexander Mark. Alexander Mark. Can you define biosafety in your own term? Yung may kli lang, yung maaalala mo when you work in the lab. Kasi this is fundamental. You have to know what biosafety is when you start and finish your lab work. No? Oh, you na lang host, kasi siya yung pwedeng magsalita. <laughs> Mr. Host. I think, sir, mahiyain po yung mga participants natin today, you know? Mr. Host I think na lang. Uh, Opo, ayan, so... Uh, very simple think, term lang. So I think uh, biosafety is well, well keeping keeping your workplace or your laboratory um, safe from well infectious uh, hazards yes. or risks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good definition. Okay. That's a good one. So yeah, you're keeping your your workplace safe safe from from pathogens. No, you 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 keep you keep yourself and the environment safe from. Pathogens. So in simple terms, by safety is protecting people from bugs. So you protect yourself from pathogen. That's a simple term. Okay, that's a simple term. Okay, now we define by security. Okay, on the simple term, Miss Girly Corpus, can you define by security? Very, very simple. Um, yung biosecurity po is parang um yun po yung magiging basehan po nung safetyness yung sigurado po okay okay that's one definition uh, how about from hero galampagan of the ost 
the hero. Let's have a, let's have a hero answer. Uh, ano sir, protocols for okay, being uh, uh, infectious. Actually, ay yung mga infectious uh, ano natin uh, na sakit Yeah. Uh, once na possibly pumasok sa atin, like uh, the issue of COVID. Okay, 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 good. So uh, when I say bugs, it's pathogen, okay? It's not insect, right? Just to be clear. So by safety, we need to protect ourselves from the bugs by safety. By security is protect the bugs from people. That's simple. We protect the pathogen from the people, from being the bugs being misused, being taken, being uh, um, a rob. Kasi kukunin nila yan at gagamitin sa, sa, sa bad. Right? So we protect the bugs from people. And then by safety, protecting people from bugs. That's, that's the simplest, simplest definition. Okay, we might be confused what is by safety and by security. They share a lot of common concepts. However, they are not identical. Hindi sila pareho. Okay, they have different uh, meaning, they have different goals. Okay, by, how do we achieve biosafety in the lab? So biosafety is reached by implementing various degrees of laboratory controls and containment. So when you work in the lab, you need control measures. Ano ba yung mga control measures na meron ka? For example, you're working with uh, E. coli, E. coli, pathogenic E. coli, for example, hem uh, enterohemorrhagic E. coli. Ano yung mga control measures na meron ka? Meron kang biosafety cabinet, that's one of the control measures. Okay, meron kang disinfectant sa tabi mo, that's another control measures. And containment, how do you contain it? You process it in a contained area, like inside the biological safety cabinet. And next, we achieve biosafety through the lab design and access restrictions. We don't allow anybody to enter the lab, and we design it to be secure. Okay, personal expertise, we need training for personnel who is processing or doing the procedure. And through the use of specialized containment equipment, such as biosafety cabinets, I've mentioned, and define operating procedures. We need an SOP before carrying out any procedures. The goal of biosafety is to reduce or eliminate exposure to pathogens. Next is, um, uh, sorry, the next is biosecurity. Biosecurity is, is not biosafety. How is biosecurity accomplished? Limiting access to the research facility, so you don't allow anybody to enter the lab. Yung anak mo, dumalaw sa'yo, pumunta ka, pum nagpa-process ka ng SARS-CoV, dumalaw, pumunta sa lab. So, hindi mo alam kung anong pwede niyang hawakan kasi ang mga bata, hahawakan kung anong gusto hawakan. They don't know biosecurity and biosafety, right? So, we don't, we don't allow people, just anybody, to have access in the lab. We, have, we need the lab to be secure, especially when you are handling a risk group three and four, even to uh, organisms. Next is secure research materials and information associated with that agent or, or research. And the goal is to prevent accidental or deliberate release or misuse of pathogens, okay? What are the principles of biosafety in virology laboratory? First is, the bio, first is the biohazard and risk groups. What are biohazard? What are the risk groups? Practice and procedures in biosafety level labs. Ano yung mga ginagawa natin sa lab? So are we following standard practices and procedures? Activities to be carried out in which BSL level? So are we doing, uh, are we processing BSL level for the right organism? Next, the personnel. Are the personnel trained or competent? Alam ba nila kung anong ginagawa nila? Next, are the training and mastery of the procedures? Are personnel and the lab worker trained and they know, they know the procedure well? And are they employing the use of the PPE? And then the next is containment. Next is safety equipment. Are, what are the equipment that we are using? For example, you are processing tuberculosis. Is, this has to be processed in the, in the biological safety cabinet. This infection and sterilization, we should know the principle of this. And what are the different kinds of disinfectant and sterilization methods? And the facility design and construction of the, of the, the biosafety laboratory, okay? Next. What are the biohazard? We don't know biosafety if we don't know the enemy. So we know we should know what is biohazard, okay? 
It is defined as infectious biological agents presenting a risk or potential risk to the well-being of man, animal, plants, insects, and other microorganisms. So this could be any of this. Biological agents could be anything from virus, bacteria, fungi, or spores, or rickettsia, or chlamydia. Okay, recombinant or synthetic nucleic acid molecules, DNA or RNA. So we might not know, uh, but some of us might know that some DNA and RNA are infectious. You don't even need the whole virus to get the cell infected. That is what we call transfection, okay? So in virology, you just, in, you just um, uh, transfer the RNA inside the cell and then the virus will be made. There's no virus being infected. You just transfect the RNA. Trans RNA will become protein. Protein will now generate the, will now, um, polymerize the RNA, the, the, the parent RNA, and then it will make a new virus, okay? So some RNA are, are infectious on a naked form, like for example, a good example is foot and mouth disease virus. Biological toxins also is a, a biohazard, venoms and prions, okay? Cell lines that we are using are also biological hazards. You know, the most con common contaminant in the lab uh, previously is the HeLa cells. HeLa cells can contaminate any cell line. So these are biohazards to other cell lines, okay? Ne next is the novel nan nanoparticle conjugated to biologically active or cell-modifying molecules. So the siRNA, antibodies, effector proteins, and others. And next are the non-indigenous materials, plants, microorganisms, or insects. So these are the, the materials that are not native to the area. For example, you are in the Philippines, you are bringing some imported alien form from other countries, it's not native here, they are biohazard to the Philippines. Okay. Now, um, biohazard symbol, of course, if we know biohazard, there should be a biohazard symbol. We see this every time. So the biohazard symbol is normally found on substances, materials and containers with potentially infectious um, substances. Uh, the symbol is a fluorescent, orange or an orange red color. Okay, so you can see it on the screen. There's no requirement for the background color as long as there is a sufficient contrast to permit the symbol to be clearly defined. So as long as you can see it, you can use it, okay? The symbol shall be as prominent as practical of a size consistent with the size of equipment or material to which it is affixed and easily seen from as many directions as possible. So when you are getting a biohazard bag, the biohazard symbol and the bag are big. So you can see it from afar that you are, there's a biohazard bag there in the lab, okay? Or it is full of contaminated materials. So there's a biohazard sign big enough for you to see. So the symbols developed by 19, in 1966 by Charles Baldwin and of Dow Chemicals and Robert S. Runkel of the NIH. So initially, ang gusto ng, ng scientists, magkaroon ng symbol, it doesn't mean that it's important symbol or doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's uh, attractive. So ang gusto lang nila is, uh, memorable yung symbol, and uh, but it's meaningless. So itong symbol na nakikita natin na to, na three circles, three circles, and one circle in the middle doesn't mean anything. Okay, but it's recognized now as a biohazard symbol. Okay, now we go to the risk group of our microorganism. We have to know how our micro microorganism grouped, okay, according to infectiousness. Microorganisms are classified into risk groups based on their impact on humans and the environment. This list, this, the list that I am going to provide are not exhaustive, okay? There could be many. And microorganisms are generally classified as follows. Risk group one, no or low individual and low community risks, okay? Example of this is Bacillus satellis, E. coli, the DH5 alpha that we are, uh, we are um, using in the lab, okay? So this doesn't cause any disease to human, maybe to a uh, very, very immunocompromised, but Bacillus satellis is everywhere. The H5 alpha doesn't even um, uh, survive on a, on a living cell, okay? But this is the one that we use for transformation. If anybody here is transforming a plasmid, you transform the plasmid to the H5 alpha. Next, risk group two, uh, moderate to individual risk. Low community risk, effective treatment and preventive measures are available and risk of infection is limited. You might be surprised, measles is here and hepatitis B virus is here. Those, so those are risk group two. They can be contained. They are not as infectious if you are processed them in the lab, okay? Like hepatitis B virus. Uh, they cannot be, you cannot inhale it. You just um, get infected by puncturing yourself. 
So they are classified, although they are highly pathogenic, but they are not highly infectious. Okay, you can control them once they come to the lab. Like for example, there is a respiratory pathogen that comes to the lab. The respiratory pathogen will not disperse into the air alone. It needs human intervention to be dispersed in the, in the air, yeah? So kung meron kang hawak na, for example, SARS-CoV-2 dyan, if nandyan lang naman yan sa lab, you don't have to be afraid. Kasi nakatayo lang naman yan sa, nakatayo lang naman yan sa, sa bench. Wag mo, wag mo lang, wag ka lang magproduce ng aerosol, you are safe, right? And every time you receive a sample, you have to put it inside the biological safety cabinet. Risk group three, high risk individual, high individual risk, low to moderate community risk, SARS-CoV-2, mycobacterium tuberculosis, and MERS. So SARS-CoV-2, it is being now downgraded to risk group two, okay? It used to be risk group three, depending on the country, in the Philippines, it could be still in risk group three. So uh, every country has their um, um, advisory committee or advisory council that assign organisms in every rich, uh, risk group. So this is what I'm saying in the beginning, we should have this um, uh, agency to, to create um, or assign each organisms that we process into any other, uh, um, into each risk group. Risk group four are high individual and high community risk. Okay, usually cause lethal human infection and may be readily transmittable. Okay, an example of this is Ebola, Marburg virus. So Ebola and Marburg virus, Ebola, uh, they said that it's not um, uh, um, transmitted by aerosol, but some research says they do. So, but they do, uh, they, they are transmissible by direct contact. So and it's, there's no, it's, it's classified as risk, risk group four because they don't have treatment nor vaccine. So anything that is classified under Viruses under that, no treatment and no vaccine will be on the risk group four. Okay, after knowing the, um, okay. Um, so risk groups sometimes correlate with the containment facility requirements. For example, risk group two organisms should be processed in BSL2, but it doesn't mean it's only in BSL2, you can process in BSL3 and BSL4, but you don't need to. Okay, so risk group two organisms should process in risk group two. Risk group one can be processed in any of the labs. So starting from one to four, but risk group four cannot be processed on the lower level of the laboratory. Okay, after knowing the risk group, we should know the routes of the transmission. Of course, it's a, one of the unfortunate event is to have yourself infected, okay? But how did you get infected by this organism? You need to know what are the routes of transmission. First is injection, okay? It's it. Uh, by accident, usually by accident. So when you use a needle and um, uh, manipulate um, a live animal, for example, and then you accidentally inject yourself instead of injecting the animal. Okay, so, so these are accidental puncture. Animal bites, it scratch, it scratches, and through broken or abraded skin. So of course, before you go to the lab, you cover your, you cover your um, uh, open wound, or you don't process at all in the lab when you have an open wound, okay? Next is absorption. Okay, um, this is just splashes to the eyes because eyes and the mouth, these are rich in mucous membrane. So when you splash something to the eyes, you cannot disinfect your eyes, right? So it will be absorbed. So just be very careful, wear goggles or a mask to prevent that. And then of course you have opening on your skin, you have scratches on the skin, this, the mucous membrane that in there is exposed, then it will be, uh, any organism will be absorbed. Ingestion, of course, eating, drinking, applying cosmetics, hand-to-face movement. There are many of these, like uh, the one that we see on the picture, are uh, touching fomites. So when you touch fomites and then you touch your face, this is how you spread uh, the, um, the organism, especially this uh, uh, organism that we have now, the SARS-CoV-2, or SARS even SARS-CoV-1. Okay. Common colds is a good, very, very good example of transmitting two fomites. You don't even know when you handle a door, you touch already a coronavirus that causes common cold and then you have it. Okay, and then the most common one are, and the most dangerous of course, uh, is, and most effective is inhalation or aerosol. So you do this, like what I said, is by human manipulation in the lab, it, the sample itself will not produce aerosol if it is alone in the lab. So you are doing, you are producing the, the aerosol formation, either by vortexine, centrifugation, mixing, or pipetting. 
okay? And then you manipulate syringes, packages, you drop something and then, or um, uh, open a sample container after mixing it. So we have to do processing always inside the biological safety cabinet if we know that you are processing a sample that can be transmitted through inhalation. Okay, this is one example of an aerosol formation. This is a blowing of the pipette. You see how, how small are the aerosols that blows, that goes from it. This is just a, a glass pipette being blown out. Okay, so if you are processing here, for example, uh, um, in the respiratory virus, you will create millions or thousands of, um, of uh, aerosols spread into the air. So now the question, after knowing all of that, we have this question. You are a virologist that is supposed to work with influenza virus subtype H1N1, potentially devastating virus. Um, precautions must be taken in the, in the lab to make sure you and others are not infected, okay? Where in the lab would you complete your work? And what protective equipment and practices would you use, okay? Can I hear from Maria Teresa? Maria Teresa, is she there? And Miss Maria Teresa po. Um, for those uh, participants po natin na wala pong mic, I think they can also uh, type, in their, type in their questions po sa chat box po. Yeah. They can also try. Oh, technical. Ayan, so no mic daw po. So, I ano think... Ano mo? Ano mo? Nagpapay na ka, ano? Nagtatanong sa attendees. <laughs> so, I think they can, ano po, try na um, i-chat po yung uh, answers nila. Thank you yes. po. Okay, medyo matagal, no? So, anyway. So, uh, these are the questions, but then the answer... So the answer to this is you have to understand the principles of biosafety for biosafety levels in the lab. So before you can answer, ano yung 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 saan mo isa ipa process? Because you have an idea that you have to process H1N1 in a biosafety level, a biological safety cabinet. But which level of the lab are you going to process it? Okay, you have to understand that. And ano yung mga protective equipment na kailangan mong gawin? For example, kailangan mo bang magsuot ng mga, ng mga uh, um, uh, laboratory coat na to cover everything, including your hair and everything when you process H1N1? Okay, so this, this needs to be um, understood by everybody. I'm Okay, so to, to understand the answer to that, we need to understand the principles of biosafety. So first is the personnel, okay? The personnel for biosafety do, doing, the, doing the, the, um, the procedure should be trained and competent on each procedures they carry out, okay? So you cannot just uh, do a um, uh, procedure, especially a uh, uh, handling infectious material without being trained and without being competent. Okay, competency is, I don't know how it is done in the Philippines, but competency is like you are uh, you have you will undergo a series of questions and you have to answer that, and then they will observe you how you do it. So you will be certified as competent. Of course, the person doing that will be uh, the one who is training you. And then you are trained and aware of the infectious agent they are handling. Next, you have to know the potential hazard and risks of the organism you are handling. You cannot just uh, jump into uh, doing H5N1 without knowing what it is, okay? Without knowing how you, you, you spread that. Okay, you have to understand everything about the organism first and the risks associated with it. Emergency procedure in, in case of accidental exposure, you should also know that. And Train supervisor is always, it should always be around. You should not be working alone in the lab if you are a trainee, okay? 
or you are a junior, there should be a trained supervisor that should be called when, when an accident happens. Okay. And then competency, all competency in place. The junior that is doing that or the trainee doing that are competent and the supervisors are competent. Okay, next are the policies. So what are the policies on the uh, by safety? Policy on personal environmental protection. Okay, so policy on personnel is like, uh, no personnel should be uh, processing uh, this level or risk group without uh, being trained on that. Okay, we should have a solid policy on that. And the personnel should be trained on how to handle that, how to dispose, how to clean up spills, and how to protect the organism from spreading into the environment inside the lab. This is not environment outside. This is, we're not talking about the labscape. It's, we're talking about the environment inside your laboratory, environment within the laboratory, okay? Now, uh, next is the um, uh, guidelines for working safely in the laboratory. So what are the guidelines, um, established guidelines in the laboratory? So you should have that as a policy. Next are the guidelines to describe practice techniques safety equipment and other facilities which will ensure safety. Next principle of biosafety is the personal protection or personal protective equipment that you wear. Okay, personal um, protective equipment is often used in combination with biological safety cabinets. So you wear your, 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 your PPE and then you go to the biological safety cabinets and other devices that contain the agents. Also, when you process animals, this also includes your, your specimens that you handle everything. When, before you touch that, you wear your PPE and your, your, you go to the biological safety cabinet. Depends, the PPE that you will use will depend on what organism or risk group of the organism you are handling, okay? And um, the PPE forms the primary barrier when working in BSC. Uh, this is, um, uh, as uh, the, I said here, is impractical, okay? Because, how do I explain this? So when working with the BSC is impractical, like you cannot work in the BSC because you are working with live animal. You wear PPE to, to, to have your um, self-protected, Okay, that is your primary protection. That is your primary barrier. Because when you work in the BSC, that is the primary barrier. The BSC is the primary barrier. But when you cannot um, work with the BSC, for example, you are doing a centrifugation, ultra centrifugation. Ultra centrifuge is bigger than the BSC, so you cannot process inside. When that is impractical, wear your PPE. That will be your primary barrier. Next. Principle of biosafety is the containment. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, defined as um, a measure including biological containment practices, safety equipment, and facility safeguards that protect workers, the community, and the environment from exposure to or an intentional, unintentional escape or, of uh, biological materials. I just borrowed this from uh, WHO though, um, because they are the best to, to protect the health. Um, it describes the safe methods for managing infectious materials in the lab. Uh, in the laboratory, um, within the, the environment within the laboratory where they are being handled or maintained, okay? The purpose of the containment is to reduce or eliminate exposure to potentially hazardous agents. So this is why you contain. You protect everybody, you protect yourself, you protect your environment, you protect every uh, your coworker. So that's why you contain the, the microorganism that you are handling. So there are three elements of the containment, personnel, so the personnel is you, so it's us. You adhere to the standard microbiological practices and techniques when you do any of the uh, procedure handling um, any risk group of organism. Okay, this is the most important element of the containment. You have to, uh, like I said, follow as OP, competent and trained. Scientists undertaking work with the emerging viruses, for example, the SARS, must be aware of the potential hazards of that, okay? And must be competent in the practices and techniques needed to work with pathogenic um, viruses or emerging viruses or re-emerging viruses. Next is the um, procedures, or is the, are the procedures in place like uh, SOP 
or um, policies for that. So laboratory practice and PPE, which is critical to prevention, to the prevention of exposure and infection by emerging viruses in the laboratory. And third is the facility design. Are you uh, able to do the procedures that you want? Do you have the, uh, for example, CL3 to process H1N1 or CL2, for example, designed as like they sometimes called um, there is sometimes called a laboratory that is called CL2 plus. So you don't have to process CL3 that is not transmitted by respiratory in a CL3. You can do that in CL2 plus. So it depends on the, the, design of, the design of the facility where if you can perform or undertake any procedures. So there is assessment of the work to be done with specific agent, we determine the appropriate combination of these um, elements. So a risk assessment, I will discuss later. How do you do that? And how are you going to uh, carry out the procedure after the risk assessment? Okay, the principles of biosafety, primary and secondary containment. The primary uh, containment provided by both good microbiological technique and the use of appropriate safety equipment. So these are the PPE I've already discussed earlier. And of course, the training and the competency that you have. The secondary uh, containment is the design of laboratory facilities to prevent inside and outside contamination. So inside contamination could be the you and a coworker, you and the sample, you and an animal, okay? Outside contamination is you carry, you carry your, um, your organism to, to somebody else outside the lab or outside your institution. So secondary containment is provided by combination of facility design and operational practices. The ventilation system is important. It controlled access to the lab, airlocks, and other facility design features must be part of any procedure. Okay, now next is the facility as a barrier. So facility design and construction Contribute to the laboratory workers' protection. Provides, it provides a barrier to protect persons outside the laboratory, okay? So the facility that we uh, use, for example, BSC, this will provide the primary barrier between you and the organism, okay? So you are safe because you, the BSC will take the, the infection, for example. So the, in fact, the, the, the pathogenic organism that is spread into the air will go to the BSC and then will will be um, filtered into the HEPA filter, okay? This also protect people and animals in the community from infectious agents which may be accidentally released from the laboratory. Okay, so the BSC, like I said, it has a HEPA filter. So before it discharges the air into the outside, some BSCs are vented outside or some are vented like have recirculating air inside the lab. So before they do this, before the BSC release the air, it is HEPA filtered, okay? HEPA means high efficiency particulate air, okay? So it's very, very small um, filter that can filter any, any aerosols or any um, um, very, very minute um, substances. Next, the institution is responsible for providing facilities that are commensurate with the laboratory's function and with the recommended by safety level for the agents being manipulated, okay? So of course, this is the institution that will uh, construct the facility, it's not you. So, uh, but you can actually help in the design if you are working there and that uh, you are trained, you can help, you can help improve the design of the, of the facility uh, based on your experience in handling the, the the organism. And then the variety of experts should be part of the design team for any new facility. So when you are already working with the organism for long, you can contribute uh, when they are want to, when they want to build a new, design, uh, a new facility for handling the same organism. So your experience will count. So what are the biosafety levels? There are, biosafety, there are four biosafety levels. So as you go, uh, biosafety level one are the lowest, with the lowest risks and with the um, handling risk group one organism that doesn't cause any disease in the healthy individual. And the activities that you can do in the BSL one are, there are many activities that you can do without uh, even have a control measure. 
But as you go up to BSL-4, there are limits of activities you can do. And also when you process, there are limits of organisms that you can process or handle. So it ranges from level one to four. Okay. The primary risk of determined levels of containment are infectivity, how infectious is the agent, okay? So uh, when you want to process uh, a sample, where, where, where do you want to process it? BSL1 or two or three? So it depends on how infectious is the sample. How severe the disease if you can, if you get the infection? How severe, like, are you going, if you're processed, uh, if you're going to process MERS, how severe is the MERS? Okay, you know that already based on the risk assessment. How is it going to get into your body, the transmission, okay? So is it by inhalation, by, um, by uh, injection, or by scratches? And the nature of the work conducted, what are the natures? Are you going to manipulate it, creating so much aerosol? For example, um, algae or, or not, or are you going to process a, um, a biosafety level to organism with large volume, for example? Uh, people processing HIV specimen or hepatitis B specimens, they usually deal, uh, process this inside the, uh, not in the BSC um, uh, cabinet because they are not um, transmitted through air. But if you are processing a large volume, for example, blood bags, like gallons, gallons of HIV positive samples or gallons of hepatitis B samples, the control measure there is different. It's already different from the one that when you are doing it in a test tube, in a patient's tube, single tube of five mil, rather than a blood bag of one liter. So that's different now. So, because when you spill a one tube, it's very easy, but if, when you spill a two liter uh, bottle of blood full of HIV virus, that's different uh, story. So you have to process that maybe inside the biological safety cabinet because when you spill it in there, it's controlled. Okay, it's contained. This is the primary containment. Because when you spill that outside of it, this is very dangerous now. Okay, each biosafety label has its own specific containment controls that are required for the following, laboratory practices, safety equipment, and facility construction. Okay, let's go to the biosafety level one. What is a biosafety level one then? Okay, BSL-1 laboratories are used to study agents not known to consistently cause disease in healthy adults. Okay, I already mentioned some of the organisms in here. These are normally found in the environment or uh, pathogenic to animals, but not pathogenic to human, like canine hepatitis. E. coli, DH5-alpha, or Bacillus subtilis, I already mentioned. They follow, they follow basic safety procedures and require no special equipment or design features, okay? Most ordinary laboratories are classified as BSL-1. For example, laboratory, science laboratory, in the student laboratory, for example, you are uh, doing experiment on the bench, that's already, that's also, that's, is BSL-1, by safety level one. You're just doing experiment on a university laboratory, that's by safety level one. Okay, so what are the procedures and practices we call this standard microbiological practices or the standard operating procedures for the BSL-1. Of course, in every laboratory, you don't wear sandals, right? So you wear the shoes. Of course, you need a biosafety manual to do your procedure, okay? And then you need to be trained. The lab worker is the key element and must be trained and competent. I already mentioned this. Hold on. Next, basic PPE is required, okay? You need a glove, you need a coat, you need a goggles if you are um, uh, manipulating large volume. Even if it is a culture of E. coli, which is not pathogenic, if it gets into your eye, it will irritate and the eye is not a um, uh, normal, the eye is not a uh, normal um, uh, um, habitat of the E. coli. So you might get some um, irritation and conjunctivitis by E. coli. So you wear a goggles when you are manipulating a large volume of culture. Okay. 
Next, they do use of sharps. If you can avoid it, avoid it. So if you can replace the sharps with, uh, with, uh, with something that you can use without uh, um, uh, slicing, maybe you can just use other methods rather than slicing your sample. For example, uh, treat it with an enzyme. So don't use a scalpel to slice the sample. You just treat it with a, uh, um, a proteinase K, so it will be dissolved, so it's safer. And minimize the creation of splashes and aerosols. I've already mentioned that. And the contaminants of work surfaces after work with microbial other BSL designated agents. Okay, so disinfectants we will go later, but you have to understand what kind of disinfectants to what kind of organism. And the engineering controls for BSN laboratory, according to the old biosafety manual. If you have biosafety manual, you have to says you have to process bacillus subtilis in, bio, in the BSC2 cabinet, which I don't know why. You have to follow that because that is what the manual says. That is according to the risk assessment that was done before the manual was made. So there's a reason for saying that, okay? Maybe you are processing a, B, um, a bacillus subtilis that carrying a spore that is recombinant. That could be a reason, we don't know. So um, just um, uh, follow the biosafety manual. Don't do it if you don't know how to do it. Just follow the SOP or the procedure. So what are the equipment and facility design? Basic equipment, not for infectious, infectious materials can be used with caution. Okay, microscopes, centrifuge, ordinary labwares, these are the equipment in, the, in a um, uh, BSL-1 laboratory. The work can be done on open lab bench, I mentioned. A risk, a sink must be available for hand washing. This is ordinary in any laboratory. The lab should have doors to separate the working space with the rest of the facility and BSL-1 labs do not require special containment equipment like BSC cabinet. Now BSC level two, what are the, uh, what is this level? This level is used to study moderate risk agents, okay? Uh, the BSL2 organisms that we use here are some are pathogenic or, or even uh, deadly, for example, dengue virus or hepatitis virus or hepatitis C. But these are not spread through inhalation. That's why it is designated to the level two laboratory. If these viruses are respiratory viruses, they would move up into the biological safety level three. This is according to the risk assessment that was done on those uh, organisms. So BSL2 is usually the default by safety level when working with diagnostic specimens from humans and or animals, okay? So some uh, clinical laboratories, when they work with, uh, in the hospitals, when they work with specimens, they do that inside the biological safety cabinet because that's default for that. Because you don't know, treat all the specimen as potentially infectious. You don't know what's in your specimen, if, especially if they come from humans or animals. You don't know what this is they carry. So the default is do that in a biological safety cabinet under BSL-2 condition. So BSL-2 laboratories include all the procedures from BSL-1. So all BSL-1 procedures is included in there. Restricted access to workspaces, Procedures where infectious or possibly infectious aerosol splashes are done, okay? And uh, most um, uh, likely in the biological or ideally in the biological safety cabinet. Personal protective equipment for BSL-2 is, um, uh, is uh, the, the primary one is the BSC cabinet. It's, it's either class one or two. I will discuss what's the difference of the biological safety cabinet class one, two, or three later. And then you need a sterilization equipment like autoclave or, um, or a um, uh, oven for dry heat and a higher risk assessment, rather uh, higher than the uh, biological safety level one. So the house, the facility design of the biological safety too. So this is an example in the picture of the blue door. Uh, lab coats must be worn inside and it is restricted. Okay, and then there is also a sign in there what could be handled inside this laboratory. Okay, these are the typical laboratory door, I'm sorry. Okay, um, the BSL-2 facility design is the basic from BSL-1, but in addition of um, 
uh, handling BSL-2 agents. When you handle BSL-2 agents, what do you need? Of course, like we mentioned, BSC. And access to the lab is restricted. The design of this laboratory should facilitate easy cleaning and decontamination. So the design is like, you will have a very uh, a smooth surface. So when you have a spillage, it's smooth and it's not absorbent. And the floor should not be an absorbent floor. It's, you cannot have a carpet inside the BSL-2 laboratory, okay? So it should be a smooth floor so for easy decontamination. Windows that open to the exterior are not recommended. So BSL-2 are not recommended to open windows. I have not seen BSL-2 before with open windows. I don't know, maybe there are some, but I have not seen. Uh, there are BSC installed and should be ergonomics and does not disturb air supply. So when I say this, you know, in the laboratory, you will have this air condition, you will have electric fan and you will have your biological safety cabinets. So especially in the Philippines, we have fans, maybe we have fans in the, in the lab, or of course we have aircon. So this should not be placed directly into the BSC because it disturbs the airflow. The airflow of the BSC is the fundamental thing that is working in the BSC. You should not disturb this, okay? And then, HEPA filter exhausted air or the exhausted air from a plus two BSC can be safely recirculated back into the lab. Some BSCs recirculate the air, filtered air, some don't. So some are uh, vented outside. You can choose whatever, uh, what you want when you design a BSL2 laboratory. And of course, Iowa station should be readily available. So the facility design, autoclaving facility should be near. So this is a big autoclave. So because BSL2 waste are all biological waste or contaminated waste. So they should be autoclaved before discharging into the whatever you, wherever you discharge it to the environment, like um, landfill or incineration. It should be autoclaved first for safety. And then proper warning signs regarding the potential hazard should be evident to everyone entering the laboratory. And uh, equipment should be routinely decontaminated after spills or splashes, okay? And um, the equipment exposed to infectious agents should be cleaned and decontaminated before removal from the lab for any occasion. For example, you want to remove a um, microscope. You have to clean that first before you remove that because the one that's next to be using the microscope, he doesn't know who she doesn't know what kind of organism you use when you uh, check it under the microscope. Or when you want to um, send um, equipment for repair, for example, a laptop or a um, machine for, or your PCR machine, you should um, decontaminate this and put a decontamination notice or decontamination certificate on the machine and then you can take it out. Because the person who's, gonna, who's going to repair that machine are not um, a bio, a biomedical scientists. They are not, they are not scientists, they are engineers. So they are not trained to decontaminate or, or process some um, uh, equipment or know the principles. They might not know the principle of the disinfection. Um, all procedures involving the handling and manipulation of BSL-2 agents should be conducted in the BSC or other physical containment devices. And animals and plants not associated with the work Performed will not be permitted in the lab. So, maraming laboratory merong alagang halaman. So, <laughs> may mga halaman sa, sa bintana. So, hindi yun permitted sa level 2 laboratory. Okay. Now, level 3 lab. So the laboratory lab builds upon the containment requirement of BSL-1 and 2. Okay, all the requirements of BSL-1 and 2 are also in BSL-3 lab. And um, if you work in a lab that is designated as BL-3, the microbes there can be either indigenous or exotic. So have to take note of that. So you might be processing some um, microorganisms collected from somewhere. And it's in the BSL-3 because that is the default. You don't know how infectious is that organism? So they could be exotic or, or they could be indigenous, you, you don't know. Um, this or microorganism could cause serious um, or potentially lethal disease through respiratory transmission. Like for example, when you collect sample from the ducks, it could jump to the human in a laboratory. So you have to process it inside the BSL-3 with negative pressure inside the biological safety cabinet. 
So these uh, BSL-3 laboratories are used to study agents that can be transmitted by aerosol and may cause potentially lethal infection. Researchers perform lab, man lab manipulations in class one or two BSCs or other containment equipment. So class one and two, uh, for those who are not familiar in the biological safety cabinet, they protect the operator, they protect the person. Okay, there is a difference between the class one and two in protection of the sample that you're processing, but I will discuss that later. And other safety um, features employed are, um, are closing the contamination. So your clothes that you wear, uh, sealed windows, double door access, and specialized ventilation system. Uh, so in inside a laboratory of a CL3, uh, you know, if you have been, or many of you have been, you will feel the negative pressure. So the negative, when you go in there, you will have a sticky, a sticky uh, foot, uh, foot pad. So anything that you carry on your shoes will stay there. Then you leave your shoes. There is an anteroom that the design of this is there's an anteroom. So you wear your clothes like this guy is wearing on the like letter A. You wear that in the anteroom. And then you remove your shoes. You wear uh, shoes for the lab. And you wear your PPE outside of the CL3 lab. Anything that you bring inside the CL3 will not go out without being sterilized. So don't carry a phone inside a CL3 laboratory. You will not be able to get that out unless it is formal, formal vapor sterilized. Okay, the sterility method in CL3 is not alcohol because some of the viruses there are not killed by alcohol. So if you're thinking that you can uh, clean your phone, carry it in the CL3 lab and clean it outside with, a, with an alcohol, no, you're wrong. In, the, in, in here, I work in the CL3 lab that is very strict in here, so we cannot, we have a dedicated like a tablet inside the labs and we cannot take that out. We cannot take anything out, including a paper. For example, I'm preparing an experiment to do in a CL3 lab. I will have to post that outside the, the, the sheet that I'm carrying. I have to post that outside of the, of the CL3 lab on the window, glass window, and then read from there or carry paper inside and throw it there. So you cannot take that paper out again, whatever you carry again, inside cannot be taken out without being sterilized. And the sterilization in the room is a formalin vapor. So the formalin vapor is very um, strong and um, irritant and uh, potentially carcinogenic. Uh, so the organism includes, um, the organism that is processed in the CL3 lab are culture of most non-respiratory viruses, dengue, Zika, um, uh, uh, blue tongue viruses. These are I, I mentioned earlier on handling of dengue, Zika viruses, or other bloodborne viruses can be handled in BL2, uh, biological say BSL2. That's handling, okay? But not culturing. When you culture this, you are propagating so much virus that it poses a great hazard. You have to do this in a CL3 lab, okay? And then handling or culture of respiratory pathogens like H1N1, this is understandable. This is, these are respiratory, asignia, MTB, these are bacteria and SARS or rabies. Rabies can also be handled in the CL2 lab, but this is culture. So you have to do it in CL3. So what are the standard procedures and practices in a CL3 lab? So this um, builds upon the containment requirements of BSL one and two, plus the scientist lab or, lab or lab workers are under medical surveillance and immunizations may be required. So in the laboratory, some, labor some CL3 laboratory, you cannot even work in there if you are not vaccinated on all viruses that you are handling and some of the possible uh, pathogens. So this will be done by the occup occupational health uh, unit of your uh, institution. Trained personnel should be in there on handling infectious agents. And of course, competency should be in place. Limited access to laboratory. This paulit ulit tayo dito. So, kailangan talaga to kasi nung nasa Pilipinas ako, laging mayroong bisita sa lab. So, uh, okay lang din sa akin nandun pa ako. So, but now, I just found out that it's not allowed. So, yeah. Especially in CL3. The universal biohazard symbol must be visibly placed on doors at the laboratory entrance. If safety emergency procedures in place, and use of sharp or materials made of glass are not allowed. So when you are in CL3, you want to carry um, any materials, for example, your media or your, your agar for black assay, 
you cannot carry that in a glass or Ellen Mayer flask, butter or Duran, or Duran butter. No glass is allowed inside a CL3 lab because of possible breakage and you will hurt yourself with the pathogen. So you cannot carry a sharp, you can't carry a syringe, you can't carry a scalpel, you can't carry a, a glass. So if you want to carry a media or, or a agar, you have to put that in a plastic bottle. And uh, any procedure should be re uh, you, um, that um, requires sharps should be replaced something with, without uh, using a sharp. Okay. So what are the equipments in the uh, CL3 lab? In addition to BSL-1 and 2, biological safety cabinet class 1 and 2 I've mentioned, formaldehyde vapor apparatus. So this is very fundamental because you disinfect the whole room with it. UV lamp apparatus, after your um, procedure, you turn on the UV lamp to kill everything and suspend it or on the surface. All procedures involving the handling and manipulation of such agents must be performed in a BSC. You cannot perform any procedures outside of the BSC, even preparation of your sample. It has to be inside the BSC, even um, um, labeling or anything is inside the biological safety cabinet. Spill kit should be available. The PPE includes a front, a solid front um, with a tie back laboratory attire or wrap around gown. So um, if you see this, um, the coat that ties at the back, this is the coat that is required in CL3. Should not be uh, like my button saharapan. That is not allowed in CL3. So like your straight jacket. So these are the type of coat that is um, used in the CL3 lab. And autoclave and other sterilization equipment should be available always. So what is the construction of the CL3? The room is sealed. There's a negative pressure in there. So when you get inside there, you will feel the air coming, like, like a wind blowing into your, into your face. So this is the CL3 lab, the first, the first photo, and it is sealed. It's the glass, the glass window that I am talking about. So if you want to carry a paper, you just post it outside and then just read it from the inside. So this is CL3 lab. And exhaust air can be recirculated. That never happens in CL3. So biological safety cabinet always vented outside. This is the vent of the biological safety cabinet to outside. Transport system for contaminated materials should be in place. BSL3 lab must be accessed through two separate self-closing and locking door. So the CL3 lab has a lock. It's actually, um, uh, there's a locking mechanism that you need a, a, um, a code. And nobody knows that except the, one, the people working in the CL3 lab. So here in the UK, I have not encountered a CL3 lab that doesn't have a code or doesn't have a secure door. So I don't know in the Philippines if there are already a CL3 lab because when I left, there's one, but it was um, demolished. So now I don't know. So this could be, um, this is one of the control measures that should be in place. Uh, ceilings and walls should have a smooth finish. If you see that all are painted white, it's smooth for easy decontamination. Floors must be slip resistant, waterproof and resistant to chemical. The entire laboratory must be decontaminated in case there are major renovation, maintenance shutdowns or any other significant changes to the laboratory space. So when I was working in the CL3 lab, if they announced like, oh, there is an engineer coming to repair the microscope because you cannot take the microscope out of the CL3 lab. We have to fumigate the whole laboratory and wait for one week until the, 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 the formaldehyde a vapor dissipates before the engineer can come or we can come. So that is actually a hindrance to our work because we have to wait like one week preparation and then one week again for um, one week again for the for the uh, safety entrance of the personnel. So we usually do the maintenance at the end or mid uh, year, for example, at the end of the year in Christmas time. So everything will be decontaminated. Every maintenance should be performed at that time of the year. So to minimize uh, disruption into your work. So all vacuum lines must be protected with HEPA filters in addition to liquid disinfectants in the traps. So this is the ventilation design of the CL3. You see this, this is the, this is, um, the, um, the air vented outside. This is the CL1. This C CL1, and this is another CL1. 
So CL1 is the um, uh, containment level one biological safety cabinet. It's not containment level one lab. It's a containment level three lab using a containment level one biological safety cabinet. So it protects the operator. It protects the person, but not the, um, but not the, the sample. So the vent uh, ventilation adducted outside. This system provides sustained directional airflow by drawing air from clean areas into the lab. Containment devices that contain HEPA filtration, BSCs will serve as a primary barrier between you and your sample. And HEPA filters must be tested and replaced annually. And facility design, operational procedures, and parameters must be documented prior to full operation of BSL3 laboratory. Okay, uh, BSL4. So I don't know if you're going to have this. Uh, this is just um, some of the, the features of BSL4. Okay, Biohaz biological uh, agents or biohazard agents that are under BSL4 are dangerous and exotic and pose a higher risk through aerosol respiratory transmission. So infections caused by these microbes are always, almost always fatal and there are no um, known uh, treatment or vaccine, okay? Any novel or new viruses must be processed in the BSL-3 or BSL-4. This is also the maximum containment lab level that is available. There is one, they say BSL-5, um, biological safety level five, but it's, it's used by NASA for the outer space samples that they collect. They don't do it. I think they do that in the BSL-5. Okay, there are only a um, um, uh, small, uh, small number of BSL-4 in the, around the world. Philippines doesn't have, maybe we will have in the BIP in the future, maybe next year we'll have a BSL-4 and many BSL-3. So what are the procedures and practices that we do? So just read over in this. Uh, I don't know if you are going to use this in the near future, but uh, for your information, it's written in here. And the lab personnel should be trained and competent. This is very strict in BSL-4. And even go near the BSL-4 without knowing any uh, safety features of it. Oh, the equipment is the BSL-3 equipment plus any other equipment that is mentioned in here. And the facility design, all work must be done inside the laboratory uh, safety cabinet. There are two kinds of a BSL-4, the suit laboratory where you wear suit, or there is a cabinet laboratory where you use a glove cabinet. It's a class three cabinet. Okay. So ideally it should be in a separate building, but if it's not possible, then it should be an isolated floor, like the top floor where nobody can access. Okay, these are also the features of CL3. So these are the examples of CL1. BSL-1, BSL-2, BSL-3, and BSL-4. So BSL-3 and BSL-4 has another room for processing um, the waste. For example, you have your liquid waste. It will not go through the waste directly. It should be processed in a room beside the, the CL-3 or CL-4 room. And then after that, it will go to the waste. And also it processes the air. It processes everything. So this is how we... Uh, that is um, uh, being done in the UK. Maybe it's also gonna be done in the Philippines. So what are the biological safety cabinets? This is the primary barrier between you and the samples, okay? This is the single most important equipment in the laboratory. This will be your best friend when you are working in a virus institute. So um, you and the biological safety cabinet will see each other more than you see your wife or your, or your husband. It provides a primary barrier, as I said, and the principal or main safety device used to, do, to provide containment of infectious process or aerosol generated by many manipulative procedures. So there are three types of um, biological safety cabinet, class one, two, and three. The class one protects the, sub, the, the person processing, the person that is uh, doing the work is protected because the air is sucked inside. So all the air, in the lab is being sucked in a class one cabinet. So whatever you are processing in there will be, will be contaminated because it's all the air that is sucking in. Okay, if you want a sterile sample at the end of your experiment, don't do that in a BSL-1 cabinet or class one cabinet. 
because all the contaminated air will go inside, but you are protected. You will not get any infection from the manipulation or any aerosol because it's being sucked, okay? Class two cabinet protects the person and uh, um, the sample. So there are two types of uh, flowing of air. From the outside, it flows into the vent that is near the, 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 the window. And then from the particulate air that is blowing from the inside, this is, is sterile air, this is to protect the sample. Okay, this is the sterile air that goes out of the HEPA filter. This will protect your sample. This is the air that comes from outside. This will protect the operator. Okay, so any aerosol that you are, any aerosol that you are um, producing will go into this vent and also into here. Okay, so you are protected as well as your sample. The class three cabinet protects the um, operator that not, might, that might not be a sample, but it also protects the sample. This is completely closed. There is a glove inside. As you can see here, there's a glove and in here. Sometimes they combine class one, this, and class two. So when you remove this window, because the flow of air in class three cabinet Oh, sorry, they combine class one and class three. Because when uh, the, the flow of air in the class three cabinet is the same flow of air as in the class one, they flowing from the outside, okay, to the inside. So when you remove this door or this window, your class three will become class one cabinet. And then you put it back with a glove, it will become class three cabinet, it's sealed. Okay. So the gas type, which is this one, okay, sorry. Safety cabinet provides the highest attainable level of protection to personnel and the environment. Okay. So air flows of different cabinets. So you will say, I have a cabinet type two, I have a clean bench, I have a fume hood. Okay, process your sample in a clean bench. For example, clean bench, process your sample in a clean bench or process your sample in fume hood. You cannot do that because the clean bench protects the sample from being contaminated. It doesn't protect the person. So what can you process in a clean bench? You can only process, for example, you're preparing a sterile media. So you pour your media under a sterile air, which is flowing from the inside with a sterile air. Okay, sorry. Here, and then goes outside. So it protects your sample. And the fume hood, well, we know what the fume hood is. This is for chemicals, right? For anything that produces the fume. So this is not for sample. Sample type, the sample that, uh, the, for processing sample, you will need a cabinet type two, cabinet type one, or cabinet type three. Okay, so if you are working in virology, this is how you design your uh, cabinet. So from the clean space to the dirty space. So this is just one cabinet, okay? So you start with the clean one here, your materials there, your process here, and then your dirty is here. It's always like that. If you are working with a viral culture or viral plaque assay or anything or any procedure, you don't mix everything inside the cabinet and don't cover ever the vent. This is where the air goes in, in here. You see there is a space in there. So don't cover that. Don't ever do this, cover it with gloves or paper because there is a blockage on the air that comes in then you will not be protected anymore. Okay, how do you measure your, how do you check if your uh, biological safety cabinet is still okay? If it is still flowing, if the airflow is safe. So you use that, you use a day anemometer. Anemometer is the apparatus that you use um, Every single, um, every single angle of the biological safety cabinet. So um, uh, usually you measure like four, four angles or five angles, and then you calculate this. If it falls below the criteria, then you cannot choose your safety, your safety cabinet. This is another test. Uh, if you want to test your safety cabinet, it's okay. The airflow is by smoke test. You see the smoke is going inside. So this is the airflow of the cabinet. Okay, this is the cabinet setup. This is a class two. And these three are class one cabinet. This one, two, three. 
Okay, now we go to disinfection. We still have like five minutes left for this or not much. Okay, before we understand uh, disinfection, we have to understand the virus, okay, the enemy. So there are two kinds, the envelope viruses and then envelope viruses. Enveloped viruses, they carry lipid bilayer on their, on their um, surface. So these lipid bilayer are sensitive for organic solvents. They're sensitive to, uh, to um, surfactants like soap, and they're sensitive to oxidizing agents, okay? Sensitive to almost all disinfectants. But the naked virus, they don't carry this uh, covering. They don't carry this membrane. They don't carry the lipid bilayer. They just carry a thick layer of, um, of protein which protect uh, the genome. They are usually resistant to ordinary disinfectant, okay? So uh, what are the examples of an envelope virus? This is HIV, herpes simplex, hepatitis B, influenza, SARS-CoV, okay? These are envelope viruses, they are easily killed. But then the, the one that are resistant are the parvovirus, because this uh, norovirus, rotavirus, hepatitis A, these are usually transmitted through fecal oral, oral uh, route. So these are resistant to ordinary disinfectant. They cannot be killed by soap or by alcohol, okay? So disinfectant refers to the elimination or virtual, of virtually all pathogenic organism on inanimate objects and surfaces, reducing the level of microbial decontamination to a safe level. Okay, because disinfectant is usually used for the decontamination of surfaces and equipment, which is not autoclavable. So disinfect, chemical disinfectants like using your, your um, Oxidizing agents like hypochlorite, iodine, or parasitic acid, or using alcohol. You cannot um, uh, autoclave one whole bag or the surface of your biological safety cabinet, so you carry uh, out a chemical disinfection. Choice of disinfection method for viruses. Enveloped viruses are the most susceptible to chemical disinfection, and non-enveloped viruses are the least susceptible. Okay, and the consideration of for practicability, stability, and compatibility with materials and the health hazards being um, uh, produced. For example, if you use formaldehyde, this is very hazardous, but it's very effective as well. This is, these are effective on the naked viruses, but also pose great hazard, health hazard to an operator. And also gaseous decontamination, this is the true formaldehyde vapor or incineration and autoclave. Okay, Let's, we have a trivia here. Bacillus subtilis, which is a bacteria, being a non-pathogenic bacteria, is easier to kill by alcohol disinfectant than Ebola virus, a very pathogenic virus. Is it true or false? Five seconds. Our participants spoken answer uh, to our chat box po, and then uh, we'll check na lang din po your answers. Thank you po. Sana po mag-participate po lahat. Just type your answer in the chat box, okay? So just type true or false, okay? The answer is false, okay? False. Because Bacillus subtilis is a spore-forming bacteria. Although it's a non-pathogenic, but the spores cannot be killed by alcohol. Ebola virus, on the other hand, is a, um, non, uh, it's an envelope virus. So it's can be easily killed by alcohol, okay? But it's very pathogenic. So the resistance or the, um, the, the, um, the susceptibility to a disinfectant does not automatically uh, follow the pathogenicity of the organism. It could be highly pathogenic, but very susceptible to disinfectant like SARS-CoV. Yeah, it could be not pathogenic like Bacillus subtilis, but very resistant to disinfection. That's why it's everywhere. It's in the environment. It's a common, very common contaminant in the lab, Bacillus subtilis. Next uh, trivia, influenza viruses are easy, are as easy to kill by soap-based disinfectant as HIV. True or false? Just type your answer. Five seconds. Okay, the so answer is true. HIV and influenza virus are both, non, uh, are both envelope, envelope viruses. So they are easily killed by soap-based disinfectants. So what did, why did I ask this? So you have to know the nature of your pathogen, the nature of your infectious agent to implement the right disinfectant to be used. Okay, 
You cannot have, for example, a rotavirus and then just clear, clean the surface by alcohol. Rotavirus will still be there, okay? Because rotavirus is a naked virus. It's a, it's a non-enveloped virus. So next, trivia is AQ solution of sodium hypochlorite often are considered to be the gold standard for surface disinfection. This is a highly effective disinfectant hypochlorite solution. This is the chloros, chloros that you use at home. So what are the disinfectant actions? We have three kinds of actions, three um, uh, killing methods for disinfectants. One is the denaturant, it denatures your protein. These are the quaternary ammonium compounds, phenol, phenolics and alcohol act by disrupting protein, disrupting protein and lipid structures. Um, they make the, the surface of the virus, for example, your, your HIV, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, these uh, denaturants are effective for uh, lipophilic envelope viruses. For example, uh, HIV, they have this um, uh, fat, they have this bilipid layer on their surface. It will be dissolved by um, uh, denaturants such as alcohol or phenol. Okay, next uh, group is the reactants, including the aldehydes, formaldehydes and glutaraldehydes and ethylene oxide. They form and break covalent bonds, altering DNA, RNA structure, and protein structure and synthesis. They actually fix the protein, okay? They fix the RNA, they alter the structure of the RNA. It renders useless. Okay, so when you are um, processing RNA or DNA, don't ever contaminate it with a, with a, with a uh, formaldehyde vapor. It renders it useless. If you know that there, um, there's this procedure that we uh, do in the lab, like cross-linking, you cross-link that with the RNA or the DNA with the protein, it cannot be broken if it's already cross-linked by formaldehyde. So permanent yun, hindi na yun, hindi na yun uh, uh, reversible. Okay, so this is, if this happens to a organism, RNA and protein will be cross-linked together inside the virus, rendering the virus dead, okay? It's used as a high level disinfectant, but are potentially toxic and carcinogenic. Oxidant disinfectants, these are the oxidizing agents and the largest group and includes the halogens. These are the chlorine base, chlorine dioxide, iodine, peroxides, and peroxy monosulfates. These disinfectants oxidize proteins, enzymes, and amino acids, making their spectrum of activity relatively broad. So these are the widely used disinfectants, household-wise or laboratory-wise. So they are highly effective and very efficient in killing and cost-effective. Okay. They have the ability to kill non-enveloped virus and it's the disinfectant of choice for this kind of viruses. For example, if you are processing rotavirus or a um, norovirus in the lab, you should have always near you a hypochlorite solution. So clean the surface, clean the, 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 the cabinet, and then after cleaning it with hypochlorite, you clean it with alcohol or you clean it with uh, distilled water. Okay, according to Spalding hierarchy, there is also actions of disinfectant. To use the correct type of disinfectant for a particular virus, we need to understand the action of each, right? Treatment with ultraviolet radiation, singlet oxygen, and hypochlorous acid usually destroy the viral genome. Whereas chlorine dioxide and heat interrupt the process of host cell recogn um, recognition of virus um, binding. So according to Spalding hierarchy on a disinfectant, the high, according to the, the, the high, um, uh, high effective or highly, highly uh, effective on killing most viruses are the, the um, uh, oxidants, the oxidizing agents, okay? The intermediate, which kills most viruses, are the denaturants. So they kill most, but they don't, they kill the non-envelope, they kill the envelope, but they don't kill the non-envelope. And the low, which are like, for example, um, weak solution of soap, weak solution of alcohol, like 10% of alcohol, or very weak solution of soap, they can kill uh, envelope viruses, but not most non-envelope viruses. Uh, for viruses, clean and the four speci three uh, specified three levels of viral sensitivity to disinfectants, presence of viral envelope, non-envelope viruses most difficult to kill, which is the, the parvovirus, Partially lipophilic non envelope viruses are highly, slightly more, in, um, are, are slightly more sensitive. 
And lipophilic or enveloped viruses are the most sensitive. I've already discussed this in the beginning. So these are the examples of disinfectants, alcohol, uh, with the mode of action in here. What is alcohol, ethyl alcohol, isopropyl, 70%. Is the most uh, ideal to use as disinfectant. Don't use 95% or don't use 40%. The reason 95% will be effective, but it will evaporate before it acts. So, pag pinahiran mo ang surface mo ng 95%, na wala na yung alcohol hindi pa siya nakakaak dun sa organism. So it should be 70%. 40% is very weak to um, to exert its action. Okay, this is the nature run. It doesn't leave residues and are effective more um, against non lipid containing viruses. Ah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, it's effective against lipid containing viruses, and I stand corrected. But for the non lipid containing viruses, it's variable. Uh, the hazard is flammable, and then the effect on viruses is effective against envelope. Some naked viruses are resistant to alcohol. So next is um, quaternary ammonium compounds. Next is the chlorine or hypochlorite, which is the oxidizing agent. There are oxidants, this is the most uh, effective. They are inexpensive and wide bacteria spe uh, bactericidal spectrum and also virucidal. And the weak solution can also be effective, effective against envelope, envelope and non-envelope viruses. Phenolics, they are denaturants, okay? and effective on enveloped viruses, but most naked viruses can still survive. I have the force with this is a oxidant. It's like um, the, the, it's like the chlorine base, like hypochlorite in action. They are similar. Hydrogen peroxide is also oxidant. It's also oxidizing agent. So they are similar to, to the chlorine based. Formaldehyde, they are reactants, okay? So this is formaldehyde are usually used in fixing cells, fixing, um, for example, you are doing your plaque assay in the, in the virus lab. You kill your cells and your virus by adding formaldehyde because you want um, a very stable uh, plaque. You don't want it to be dissolved. So the formaldehyde will fix the protein and cell membrane and the virus in the plaque, okay? So it doesn't do any damage. It will have a clear, and beautiful plaque after you fix it with formaldehyde, of course, they will be killed, both of it. So this is effective against envelope and non-enveloped viruses. And of course, the parasitic acid. And yeah, and the last is the autoclave. The, we employ heating when chemical disinfectants are impractical. So this provides a physical method for disinfection and sterilization. Uh, you need a high temperature in order to kill organism and spores. So you need 121 degree, okay, of uh, heat before you can kill the microorganism and spores. 15 minutes, 15 pounds pressure. Um, okay, or oh, 30 minutes in here. But you can never, never autoclave flammable, reactive, corrosive. You know this already. Household bleach. When you autoclave household bleach, it forms a compound that is um, carcinogen. So don't um, autoclave or subject the bleach into heating. It will form a compound that is possibly carcinogen. Okay, any liquid in a seal container it will burst, of course. Any material contained in such manner that it touches the anterior surfaces of the autoclave and paraffin embedded tissues. Okay, so to validate if the autoclave is working, you, you can use tape indicators. It will indicate if your uh, autoclave if your um, material has been subjected to heat of 121 or integrated chemical indicator strips, you can also use that. There's a chemical change or biological indicator, which is the most effective. So in biological indicators, you will use a strain of bacteria. It's called Stearothermophilus. So um, Bacillus in the produces a spore. So if this spore uh, survives at like uh, uh, in, after autoclaving, meaning your autoclave it did not reach a 121.1 degrees centigrade because the spore is still there. So you have to culture this uh, after autoclaving so to know that your autoclave is working or not. So now next is the biological spills. How do you address the spills? The um, biological spills should be addressed according to the type of spills, volume, <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, the supplies to properly clean a spill must be available in any lab that works with or, or stores biohazardous materials, an appropriate disinfectant which works against the agents of concern. So this kind of spill that you can see on the screen, these are the spill that is available on a CL3 and the first aid kit in a CL3 lab. Okay, when there, whenever there's a spill, large amount of spill, you have a spill kit in there. So you don't have to go outside and shout. You know, so you have a spill kit available. So this is the spillage handling. So this is the spill kit. So this, is the, 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 this is inside the biological safety cab, uh, the biological biosafety level three laboratory. So this is where the spill kit is being um, kept. It has some uh, procedure in there. And then the, the, the coat that you have to wear when you can clean the spill and the disinfectant that you have to use. So these are the, the, the steps that you will do when you encounter spill or you spill something in a CL3 laboratory. Of course, in a CL2, it's a different procedure, but this is mostly in CL3. Okay. So we already know these general laboratory procedures. I'm just refreshing you. So just read, um, just read over it. Most of us here working in the lab already do this. These are basic and fundamental. And uh, these are the GMT. If they have GLP, we, all, we have a GMT. In the VIP, we will have a GVT, good virological technique. And in a nutshell, the best way to avoid laboratory acquired infections are knowledgeable and competent personnel who are trained in handling biohazard, have an understanding of all possible routes of transmission, knowledgeable on types of disinfection, disinfectant to use, and who are professional in their laboratory safety practice. Okay. Thank you. Um, to the host, do we still have time for risk assessment and biosecurity, or I can do this next time? I think we have uh, five ten minutes, minutes, sir. Or, or okay. ten minutes, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. okay. Thank you. So. So risk assessment. Risk assessment is important when you want to do a procedure in the in the in the lab. Any procedure that you want to do, um, uh, doing an assay, plaque assay, virus plaque assay, culturing a virus, uh, receiving a sample in a tube, processing your sample inside the biological safety cabinet, climbing a stairs, or using a ladder operating a biological safety cabinet. These are done after a risk assessment is being made. So you have to do, introduce a risk assessment in the lab. When you are around the lab, of course, the chances are you will find that your workplace is riddled with hazard, okay? All posing different levels of risk. You have infection hazard, you have trip hazard, you have a uh, slip hazards, all kinds of hazards are in there. So. When you do risk assessment, you, on, you, only, uh, you don't only do risk assessment for infectious material, you also do risk assessment for accidents. For example, um, you are preparing a, a large, um, you are um, preparing a large um, volume of disinfectant, for example, alcohol solution, and then you, you spilled it. So you should have a risk assessment before doing that. So you know what to do in case of spillage or know where to prepare it. Where do you have to prepare it? Inside a, a fume hood, of course. And then, so when you, when you spill it, it's inside there, it's not on the floor, okay? How are activities in the lab done and prioritized? Who does the job and for how long? And how would you prevent infection from happening? This can be assessed, all of this through risk assessment. So to identify and prioritize potential risks, they must be assessed and acted on accordingly. The best way to do this is to ask yourself the following two questions. How severe will the consequence or harm be and how likely it is to happen? For example, you want to process, you want to process most common um, a bacteria, uh, salmonella, for example, or you want to process most uh, the, the virus that um, affects Animals, for example, foot and mouth disease virus. So if there is a consequence of a lab accident, what is the harm? So if that is at F FM FMDB, there will be no harm on people because it doesn't, it doesn't affect people, but there will be a harm to the animals if it, 
if there is a lab escape, it's a devastating harm because it will devastate the whole hog industry. So you have to know this before you, you proceed with the, with, the, with the assay. So how likely it is to happen, for example, you are processing a small amount or culturing a small amount of FNDB versus large amount or doing very um, uh, uh, 100 plates of uh, black assay. So how likely it is the accident to happen when you are doing 100 plates and one plate, okay? So this is done through risk assessment. So risk assessment is a term used to describe the overall process or method in a certain procedure and describe factors associated with it. To do this, you need to identify hazard on each procedure. So culturing of FMDB, what is the hazard in there? What is the control measures in there? What is the possible risks and risk factors? Okay, you have to identify this and then have the potential to cause harm. What this is called hazard identification. Of course, you have to identify the risk, likelihood, likelihood of harm taking place. So um, after that, you also determine appropriate ways to eliminate the hazard or control the risk when the hazard cannot be eliminated. Okay, so when you do a risk assessment, you have to identify what are the hazards. These are the harm that can be done. So hazard is the harm that can be done to the environment, to people, or to animal. And then the risk is the likelihood or the possibility of that hazard to happen. So that's the risk. So to avoid that, you need a control measures. What are the control measures for, for example, for leaking lab escape of a foot and mouth disease virus? So what is the control measure for preventing a lab escape of foot and mouth disease virus? You know already the hazard. The hazard is the harm to the animal. And the risk uh, is that you are processing 1,000 plates. There is a possible risk that it will escape because there is so much work. You will be tired. You don't know what's happening. And then you might spill it on the sink. And then without fixing it, for example, you spill a live virus in the sink. And then the sink will go to the environment and then this will be drunk by a uh, wild boar or wild pig outside. This will spread for sure. So what is the control measure? The control measure will be having a waste treatment plant before, before it goes out to the environment. For example, like in CL3 and CL4 lab, they have this waste treatment uh, machine inside the lab itself. That's one of the control measures. Another control measure is having a disinfectant beside you. That's one another control measure. For example, you're processing, you have a formaldehyde as a fixative. So this is one of the control measure, okay? So this control measure will eliminate the hazard and the risk. So you call this risk control. So the risk group of organism, I discussed this earlier. So these uh, infectious agents are grouped according to their intrinsic biological properties viruses, bacteria, or fungus, they are grouped into this group. Uh, when you are doing the risk group, consider the following, pathogenicity of the organism, virulence of the organism, mode of transmission and host range, availability of effective preventive measures, availability, availability of effective treatment. Okay, for example, you are assessing FMDV. So what is the pathogenicity? It's highly pathogenic. What is the virulent? Highly virulent. Mode of transmission is, um, um, is it airborne? Is it direct contact? So you have to identify that. And uh, is there a vaccine for that? Is there a treatment? So that is part of your uh, risk assessment when you are classifying this organism into risk group. So what are the steps in risk assessment? The five steps to a risk assessment are identify potential hazards associated with work activities. Okay, I've mentioned what a hazard is. So you identify all the hazard in every step. Identify those at risk from those hazards. Who are possible, what are the likelihoods that this hazard will cause harm to this individual or to this group of animal or to this group of plants when you are doing a experiment. Implement control measures. How are you manage, managing the risk now? What more could you do? And record the findings of the risk assessment and review the risk assessment regularly, okay? In doing the risk assessment, we use a five, point, a five by five matrix. So you score this, you score, this is the table, this is a matrix, okay? You can see the matrix there. We use this method, the person carrying out the, the, the assessment will decide, okay? For example, 
uh, I want to I, um, I want to drink coffee, for example, because drinking coffee can pose hazard to you or to your to your co-employee if you spill the hot coffee on her head, for example, because you tripped. So you use the matrix. So what is the like when you are when you are um, mixing a coffee cup on top of the table, very very filled with hot water? What is the the, the likelihood that a harm will happen. Is it unlikely? Is it rare? Or is it possible or likely or almost certain? Because it's very full, very large container, and there is no handle. What is the possibility of a hazard? Could be almost certain. So medium, right? almost certain medium. And then what is the severity of the consequence? For example, you spilled it over to a person. What is the severity? Could be severe burn. So. When you score that, for example, your, your almost certain possibility that you will cause hazard is five. And your, uh, your um, consequence is like causing a burn is high. So this high and medium here, five times five, five times five, 25. So your score is 25. You cannot carry out that procedure. Okay, you will set a cutoff, for example, your cutoff is this, this yellow here. If your score falls in below the yellow, you can't carry out the procedure. If it falls on the red, you cannot carry out the procedure. Your risk assessment says that this procedure failed, don't carry it out. So don't mix a coffee in a large, large cup without a handle filled with hot water because the score is 25. Okay, that's how you do this assessment. So that, let's translate that into, uh, into an experiment later, okay? So how to identify hazard and risk? Before the start of a new procedure, there are several things to be checked. Is the tr uh, personnel trained on handling the, the procedure? Is S are, are SOPs in place? Fire safety manual in place? Control measures in place? Equipment available? And disinfection first aid available? So these are part of your risk assessment when you are doing an experiment or um, a procedure a risk assessment. So surroundings should be also be reviewed for potential hazards, especially around high risk areas. For example, your lab is um, near, your lab is near an agricultural land with farm animals and you're processing animal virus and you don't have a uh, waste treatment plant. So you have to know the potential hazards in doing it, okay? Now, identify the hazard by identifying each task and possible hazard, and then identify the risk involved. These are the steps I uh, mentioned. And new procedures entails doing new experiments on a new type strain virus. What are the steps involved? So you have to identify all of that. Okay, then identify the risk level consequence. So what? is the, the, the likelihood that the risk will happen, the hazard will happen. Will it cause severe harm, medium harm, or rare harm? So what are the, the possible scenarios? So you have to identify those steps, including the risk level, the consequence of this risk level. Okay, so this is an example of risk assessment. I want to uh, prepare a competent cell. Uh, competent cell is a culture of a DH5 alpha E. coli. You transform a plasmid inside the E. coli, and then you will have you culture the E. coli, and then the E. coli will will now uh, produce so much plasmid that you need at the end of your procedure. So you will have your plasmid. Yeah. So in order to do that, you need an E. coli that is called competent. Competent meaning they can they can um, be transformed. They can take up the plasmid. Okay. But E. coli is a, is a bacteria. So E. coli is a, part of, uh, is a part of the family of the Escherichia family. This E. coli, there are highly pathogenic, uh, enterohemorrhagic, enteroinvasive, enterotoxigenic E. coli. But this type of E. coli, DH5 alpha, is non-pathogenic strain and it's unlikely to survive in host tissue culture or cells. So this is one of my, uh, my identification of the hazard. Okay, you want to propagate the DH5 alpha strain of E. coli to be used for your transformation experiment. You want to culture the strain in a large flask. There's another hazard there. So large flask, so identify that. You will need a 10 year supply of the strain. So how much 
liter of E. coli uh, DH5-alpha are you going to, to prepare for a 10-year supply of the strain? The possible scenario that might happen when you do the procedure is you left it mixing in a walk-in incubator, somebody knocked it down and spilled it on the floor. The person who spilled it is a healthy adult, okay? For example, somebody who is uh, uh, very, very healthy, okay? With no known allergies or no immunocompromised, um, uh, uh, with no immunocompromised condition. And you are the same. You are healthy, not, not immunocompromised. And when you were notified of the spillage, you notified the safety team immediately and started the safety process. So you went inside the, you went inside the, the walk-in incubator together with the person who, who spilled it. So what are the hazards for you and the person? You are, the, 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 the hazards here are being infected by a E. coli. But there are control measures, for example, E. coli that you use are non-pathogenic. Another one, you are not immunocompromised. Next is you are healthy. So those are other factors to consider when you're doing the risk assessment. So when you were, um, uh, well, after the incident, you made an incident report and made proper adjustment to the incident will not happen again, such as not preparing in large volumes and putting a warning sign in the incubator. So this is a scenario, okay? Imagine you have not done that yet. Okay, you are about to prepare, uh, you are about to prepare a one year supply of E. coli you have to do a risk assessment. So you have to imagine, you have to imagine, you have to think of all possible worst scenario in preparing it. That's how you do your risk assessment. And then use the table to, to, to get the final score. For example, you will prepare a um, E. coli in a five liter flask or 10 liter flask. So the likelihood of incident to happen will be five because it's 10 liter flask or 20 liter flask. Although the increasing incidence consequence because it's non-pathogenic will be maybe three because it's non-pathogenic, but because of the volume, because it's 10 liter, 20 liter, it increases into five. Yeah, it increases into five or four. So four times five is 20. You cannot carry out that procedure. You cannot carry out a procedure of culturing a 20 liter E. coli because your risk assessment says it fails. Now, what you can do is reduce the increasing likelihood by reducing the volume to, for example, 100 mil. So it becomes like number two because the possibility of knocking out a 100 mil culture is least likely. So it's number two, yeah? And then increasing consequence because it's a very, very low volume, there is no um, possibility of infecting others and there's no positive of spreading the E. coli everywhere. So it's also two. Yeah, so two times two is four, so it passed. So four, you can carry out the procedure. Now, based on your assessment that the procedure has passed and the, uh, you can only carry out a hundred mil culture of your E. coli, not 10 liter, because it failed on your risk assessment. Okay, I hope that is clear. You can ask me later if that is not clear. Okay, so where is the hazard there? The bacterial culture, not pathogenic strains, spillage on the floor, well, who can be harmed? The lab worker, you, or immunocompromised people? What is the likelihood of harm? Spillage happen in a contained area, okay? The contained area is walk-in incubator. It will not spread anywhere, okay? And immunocompromised people can walk in, but, proper, but were properly notified. So they, they already notified the people. This is possible worst case scenario, okay? It did not happen yet. You are doing your risk assessment, imagine, okay? What is the potential consequence for, of harm? Staff could sleep on the floor. Staff could get sick by contamination. So this assessment score, two times three, six. This is just an example, okay? So I put adequate, but actually it fell because of 10 liter, okay? So next step in this assessment is risk awareness for personnel. So just read over it and then control of materials used in each procedure. You need an SOP as one of the control um, measures. Then containment requirements are followed. So you need a containment. That is also another control measures. Equipment, facility design, biohazard inventory, and secondary containment. Those are control measures to be uh, used. And then the next step, again, is good practice, good virology practice. So you can read over it. And then restriction of access. 
that's it. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Paul, for that very engaging and uh, very enlightening. Um, and then, Sorry course, for the overtime. Very... It's a long uh, topic. Yes, sir. It's okay. Lang po. Uh, uh, so we still have time for our question and answer. Again, thank you very much for your very engaging and very enlightening and, of course, very interactive discussion on the biosafety and biosecurity regarding human viruses. So uh, we'd also like to commend the participants yeah, for actively participating during Dr. Fahardo's discussion. So I think uh, nag-enjoy din naman po yung mga participants natin with the uh, questions that was raised by uh, Dr. Fahardo para syempre mas maging uh, humorous din sila uh, regarding biosafety and uh, biosecurity uh, during their uh, laboratory works. So now for our uh, question and answer, I guess marami rin pong katanungan yung ating mga participants. So uh, please key in your questions in our chat box uh, in the Zoom meeting room. So our audiences from Facebook and YouTube also, they can uh, ask questions in the comment section uh, so that our moderators can pick them up and be answered by Dr. Fajardo. So I think we, uh, we already have questions ano, from uh, Facebook. And uh, we also have... Uh, some uh, from uh, our uh, Zoom meeting link. So our uh, first question from Facebook. So uh, what's the appropriate way to disinfect a room? Uh, not necessarily a laboratory, especially in the context of SARS-CoV-2. Is it UV uh, irradiation or is it the, the use of aerosol uh, disinfectants enough? Okay. Um, for the room, for example, you're inside the house or inside the... Um, uh, meeting room, for example, surface disinfection is enough. So surface, like wiping it with um, solution of soap and water or wiping it alcohol wipes. So you cannot use a um, uh, UV inside the room because remember UV acts on direct, direct uh, irradiation. If there is a paper covering that or there is a shadow, it will not act on that. Okay? So kailangan ng UV direct irrigation direct nyang ma-hit yung yung organism okay walang walang um, walang uh, uh, cover kasi kung ano man yung cover na yon kahit paper lang hindi mag-effect ang UV okay so best is surface disinfection okay sir uh, thank you for that uh, answer so another one again from facebook so which bsl lab is appropriate for the conduct of research involving the isolation and characterization of potentially novel viruses from animals. Okay, um, I mentioned earlier, if this is a novel virus, we don't know the pathogenicity and um, um, the effect and the, uh, the infection route, it should be CL3, okay? So CL3, um, safety and control measures are in place in CL3. Because these are, uh, especially if you are handling a, um, um, species of viruses in animal that is transmitted through respiratory route, you have to do that in CL3. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you. So another question. This one is uh, from Zoom. Um, is it necessary for a BSL-3 or 4 lab to secure an ISO uh, 31000 certification or is this just a guidance document? This was from uh, Engineer Reis Guerra from the OST ITDI. Yeah, all the procedures, if you want to be recognized by us, or you have to um, apply for it. So including your BSL-3 and 4. Okay, sir. Thank you. See how you do it. Yeah, they have to see how you do it. Okay. Or if not, because I know now it's all online, they have to know the procedure employing. Okay, sir. Yeah. I think. Um, so another one from uh, Facebook. So since the start of the pandemic, club classes are now conducted at home. Is it possible to perform hands-on undergrad microbiology lab experiments at home? No, <laughs> you cannot do uh, you cannot do experiments at home. There is nobody supervising you. You cannot do that. I see. So that, that's a very interesting and very timely question since yeah, we're students also, are or, yes, sir. online classes. Sir. Yeah, students are still students. They need guidance alone, especially on uh, biosafety. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, another one from Facebook. So how are we going to respond when those biosafety apparatus has failed to protect us and we have been contaminated? 
So, for example, I'm, I, I will give an example, for example, a um, biological safety cabinet, okay? So the biological safety cabinet usually has an alarm. So if it has an alarm while you are doing the procedure, it will alarm that the airflow fails. There's a fail on the airflow. What are you going to do if there's a fail on the airflow? Immediately stop your procedure, cover everything, disinfect, leave the lab. Especially if you're handling a respiratory virus, okay? There's still airflow going in and there is a negative pressure in the lab, in the CL3, you're still safe. But the safety is uh, the most um, uh, safe way to do is close all the, 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 the specimen containers, close the sash of the biological safety cabinet so no contaminated air will go out and then leave the lab after the contamination, of course. Okay, sir, uh, thank you. So um, another question from Zoom from Mr. Antonio C. de Guzman. So where would you categorize highly resistant MRS or methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. How would you categorize? I think I'm, um, he's I'm not working um, referring with MRS, to... but uh, yeah, but uh, MRS is um, uh, um, is uh, this is for mostly for hospital for hospital uh, situation, isn't it? So they clean this with um, hospital grade disinfectant. So I don't know. The question is categorized highly resistant in what category? Um, category think... or this group category? <laughs> I think he's. I think he is um, referring to the uh, category of the BSL. I think. BSL. Okay. So this group. This group is this group two. It's not a respiratory virus. And then BSL is BSL two. It's not a respiratory virus. So you can get an um, MRS through res through aerosol or through through um, respiratory route. Okay. So uh, thank you, sir. So another question from uh, Francisco Soriano from the. Uh, Philippine Science High School is UV irradiation sporicidal. UV UV spores. So they because spores are even resist in nature. Nature in nature usually spores are everywhere, right? It's outside, so it's it's outside like bacillus. They spread spores, so they um they are usually resistant to the sun ray, to the UV resistant. So they are killed, you know, uh, for example, Bacillus anthracis, there is a, um, an outbreak of Bacillus anthracis on the field. They will be killed when they uh, transform into a vegetative state. The spores will become a bacteria that will be killed by the, the UV, but then the spore itself is resistant to UV. Okay, sir, uh, thank you very much for that answer. So again, we have from Zoom from Mr. Brandon Allen Belmy. So uh, as you have said earlier, BSL-3 and 4 do not allow glass and sharps inside. So um, how do we uh, prepare culture media, which may include heating done for risk level 3 and 4 pathogens? Okay. Um, for BSL-3, for example, BSL, there are not much bacteria that uses BSL, um, uh, uh, bacteria pathogens that uses BSL-3. Usually it's for viruses and Usually, when you, you when you need a glass for liquid agar, right? For um, for media for for bacteria, you can use a dispenser. It's a plastic dispenser in the in the biological safety cabinet. And when your media is not too hot, because after autoclaving, you can transfer it into a plastic Erlenmeyer. Like for at 80 degree, 80 degrees centigrade, it's the media will not melt at 80 degree and then transfer them to biological safety cabinet to in a CL3 lab or CL4. That's what we do when I was working in the in the um, in one of the universities. So I need a melted agar. So I melt that in the in the microwave. And then when it's like 80 degree, I transfer it into a sterile um, conical tube that's sterile inside a BSC2 or, or a, um, uh, a laminar flow, which protects the, the media. And then I go to the, um, to the CL3 to wait until it reaches 40 degree, and then I can use it. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you very much for that tip, you know, for uh, so that we uh, can prepare din tayo ng media natin without breaking some of the protocols needed uh, for our BSL. So in the interest of time, uh, we'll be ending the Q&A session now. So for the remaining questions, uh, I think we'll be sharing it with Dr. Fajardo via email 
although uh, from the questions, I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Fahar has already answered it during his uh, discussion or presentation. So now, uh, to present the certificate of appreciation to our speaker, may I call on again Dr. Annabel Vibriones, uh, Director of the Industrial Technology Development Institute. Dr. Briones. Okay, thank you, Joven. Can you please uh, uh, flash our certificate of appreciation in the screen? Thank you very much, Dr. Ted. Thank you, Paul. For a very, very informative uh, <laughs> webinar. Learn a lot. Salamat. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think it's already uh, shared, ma'am. Uh, Naka-flash na po sa ating uh, screen. Okay, kasi ang aking view ay, ano, uh, <laughs> hindi siya, ano, wait, wait. La. Yes, ma'am, I think naka-spotlight na po siya. Hindi siya naka-spotlight sa akin. <laughs> Um, uh, moderators, I think uh, we can uh, try and reshare po the... Um... Kasi ang screen ay uh, mostly participants ang nakikita ko. <laughs> and, uh, our moderators will be resharing the uh, certificate, ma'am. Okay, here, here. Already? Okay, so I would like to present uh, the certificate of appreciation. Uh, Republic of the Philippines, Department of Science and Technology, Industrial Technology Development Institute, present this the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Chodoro and Fajardo Jr., Balik scientist and connected at the NH uh, Eng England Royal London Hospital, for sharing his expertise as resource person for the webinar entitled Biosafety and Biosecurity BSS on Human Virosis as part of the establishment of the Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines program, the Department of Science and Technology, held online on August 27, 2021 via Zoom, given this 27th day of August 2021, signed uh, yours truly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ted, for uh, sharing your uh, expertise and knowledge we really have uh, a very informative and active uh, webinar this afternoon. Thank you, hey, thank you very much po for, uh, from uh, Dr. Briones and of course, Dr. Fajardo for sharing his knowledge on our topic for today. So now to formally end our webinar this afternoon, let us hear from Engineer Ray Esquera. Chief of the Environment and Biotechnology Division. Sir Ray? Uh, well, I don't know if it's good afternoon or good uh, evening. Or good, in, uh, Dr. good morning. Ah, maayong good morning. Sa, maayong buntag, sir. <laughs> morning po dito, morning. <laughs> uh, of course, and, and, and our director, Dr. Annabel, uh, good afternoon. Po. And, and the rest of the uh, participants in this webinar, Again, thank you to Dr. Chodoro M. Pardo Jr., or see Dr. Ted, as uh, we've uh, been calling him, uh, uh, for sharing his, uh, his knowledge, not only during this webinar, but actually he's part of uh, the team of seven Balik scientists who are doing this webinar and also doing a lot of consultation. We've been consulting with them a lot on, on certain things. Uh, although Dr. Ted uh, would be the sixth Balik scientist uh, in this webinar series, he was actually the first one to lecture us way back uh, at the start of the pandemic. I could still recall uh, Dr. Ted uh, lectured us Virology 101. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, well, Very basic virology. <laughs> uh, Kami ni Joven, kami yung mga engineers na binabanggit ninyo na pag napunta sa, sa laboratory, eh, we might not be that cautious. So thank yes. you for uh, making us informed that we really have to, to take the necessary precautions. So, and uh, well, I, I guess what we've learned today, especially our group at the Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines uh, program, really is to look at uh, how we could still improve 
uh, eventually the because right now we're in the process of uh, having the detailed architectural and engineering uh, design of our VIP facility that would be located at the Clark New City. And uh, you were asking earlier, Doctor, that will the VIP have a VSL4? To answer you, sir, we hopefully would be the 60th uh, laboratory in the entire world, and uh, that would be <laughs> that would be very very nice. So, see, I I googled kanina as of June 14, 2021, there are on there are only 59 uh, BSL4 labs in 23 countries. So, sana tayo magim pang 60, magandang number yung 60. Ilan, ilan uh, na ang nasa U, ilan na ang nasa US? Okay. <laughs> Mamaya po, titignan ko sa Google ko lang. Usually, usually kasi nasa US yung karamihan. So. But uh, definitely, we might be the, I think we'd be the first in Southeast Asia. So, That's uh, good. Uh, so, but uh, our group is also targeting to upgrade our our uh, simple lab dito sa Bikutan to, to a BSL-2. So I do hope our my colleagues here would start reviewing our our design, incorporating all those things. Uh, of course, we I think we'll be having three biosafety cabinets in that lab. We have our own autoclave. Uh, of course, the floor would be non-sleep so that the non-porous uh, surfaces may wash station. Pero I really have to check kung, uh, if we do have that high wash station. But uh, hindi naman po kailangan ng shower, emergency shower. I, I'm not sure. Kailangan. Usually, emergency shower for fire, so. Ah, so it's for yeah. containment of uh, fire, not not necessarily yes. for the. the I see. I, I'd be more familiar because it's a chemical hazard. So. Yeah, it's a chemical. Usually, I I wash ang kailangan niya and biological. Thank you, Paul. And then the the reason why I ask about ISO thirty one thousand, because yeah. uh, although I, uh, Joven and I are chemical engineers, we're also doubling as civil engineers for the construction. Uh, portion of our, our facility. So, but uh, it's quite interesting uh, that the uh, risk assessment it's not only for what we're doing with ISO 9001 or 14001, but even for, for this lab, it, it really would really uh, help us a lot. So, I'd also like to thank the, take this opportunity to thank our host, si Joven, uh, Engineer Joven Barcelo. And of course, the help of our technological services division and the planning and um, MIS division uh, for setting up things for us and making our life e lives easier. And of course, the whole B VIP team. Now, I think we've we have an additional 12 more people so I mean group. And uh, earlier this morning, we had the prep procurement for our TEM, Transmission Electron Microscope, and the that would be one of uh, the major equipment that the uh, the VIP would be having. So again, tama po ba, Doctor? You are from Mindanao, no? Magkababayan kayo ni Director Annabel. So daghang salamat, sir. And maayong buntag ulit. And stay safe. And as always, salamat po sa lahat din ng mga nagparticipate dito po sa ating webinar. So you uh, will still be running this webinar series until April 2022. So expect a lot and learn a lot from our balik scientists. Salamat po. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Engineer Ray, uh, for your um, closing remarks for our um, resource speaker for today, Dr. Fajardo, and of course, our participants for this webinar. So again, thank you all for those who joined our learning session for today, sa ating pong participants from our Zoom meeting, sa ating mga viewers, sa ating Facebook live stream, and our YouTube live stream. So uh, please answer po this evaluation form that will be flashed shortly on our screen to secure a copy of your certificates and a copy of presentation of Dr. Uh, Fajardo. So a uh, moderator, so paki-flash na lang po yung ating QR code and then our... Uh, link for the uh, evaluation form. And then um, some of uh, ITDI personnel will also be sharing the link sa ating um, chat box. Ano? And then for the comment section ng ating um, Facebook live stream and our YouTube uh, live streams. So this has been uh, Joven Barcelo of the OST ITDI. 
do like and follow lamang po ang Environment and Biotechnology Division of ITDI Facebook page for more announcements regarding future webinars for our VIP webinar series. So again, magandang araw po, magandang hapon sa ating lahat and then magandang agham po sa ating lahat. Salamat po. Good afternoon po sa lahat. Thank you very much, Dr. Ted. Thank you po. And the participants. Mahaba <laughs> masyado, <laughs> pero... Uh, uh, ano pa nga eh, kulang nga yung oras eh. Recording stop. Paglilingkod na walang kapalit sa bayan ng aming hati. Sana, kaibigan, huwag kang magpaiwan. Gamitin ang dunong bansa'y susulong. Ating abutin ang pangarap ni Juan sa pamangkakas. Harapin, mahirap man ay kakayanin Sa pinagsamang lakas at galing Tagumpay ay mararapin Tara na, kaibigan Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa ay susulo At ikabutin ang pangarap ni Juan Sa pamamagitan na magkaroon ng effective communication means for emergencies. Pangarap kong ma-maximize yung renewable energy source and to reduce the carbon dioxide emission. Pangarap ko kong maging scientist. Maganda o simula na humanda sabay-sabay akyat hawak kamay tayo yung ating lipat lipat
Tumitilaot na ang manok, hudyat na ng pagpasok. Paglilingkod na walang kapalit, sa bayan ng aming hati. Tara na, kaibigan, huwag kang magpaiwan. Gamitin ang dunong bansa'y susulong. Ating abutin ang pangarap ni Juan sa pamangkakas. Harapin, mahirap man ay kakayanin Sa pinagsamang lakas at galing Tagumpay ay mararapin Tara na kaibigan Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa 